All right, so I'm Joe Del Rocco. Thank you for joining me. I wanted to give a, um, a webinar talk about Overleaf and LaTeX in general because I think it's a fantastic um, product and option for doing formal papers, um, not just science papers, but anything, books, uh, any kind of document that you wanna publish and you want it to look nice and clean and consistent and professional. But I know that there is a learning curve and there's resistance to it because there's a, you know, a little bit of, I wouldn't say programming, but formatting like you would see in an HTML file. Um, and so a lot of people are more comfortable with the WYSIWYG editors, especially the last uh, 20 years, they've gotten consistently better and better and better. So um, there's kind of a barrier to entry. All right. So I have a little bit of a, uh, a presentation and then we'll go and start doing some examples. So I also, I'm sorry, I also wanted to say that this is also being put on by the Computer Science Club at Stetson. Um, we have a Discord, so you can get them through there or you can get them through other channels or you can just email me or uh, Nikosi directly and we can always uh, give you information about events. They have a Facebook and all that as well. To start off, have you ever been using a WYSIWYG editor and been frustrated with it? Um, if you go searching, of course, there's definitely frustration with any software and WYSIWYG editors included. For me in particular, one of the things that I don't like, every time they come out with a new version, they kind of reorganize all the buttons or they have that ribbon uh, menu. And it, I, I've written so many documents and presentations over the years, and it seems like every year or two, I have to kind of relearn, you know, all the little special things um, that... I'm used to using. I believe these WYSIWYG editors are fantastic for quick and dirty stuff. My son is, is seven years old and he can use Google Docs a little bit. We have to get him on there, but he can type things up. They're great for assignments in primary school. You can definitely do professional documents with them as well, of course, but there's, there's kind of, this is kind of like a famous little graph by Mike Pinterick here that shows basically what I've been saying. So with a WYSIWYG editor like Word, it's a lower barrier to entry. You can get some things up nice and quickly, but the more complex a document gets, the larger it is, the more consistency you want throughout it, the more professional you want it to be. It starts to become harder and harder to do that. And there's a lot of clicking around. There's a lot of trying to find things in the editor. Um, and you're at the whim of the developers, what they've exposed to you. Because of course, they're trying to make it easy for you. That's the whole point. They've wrapped all the functionality into nice, easy to use, simple to click buttons. That's the goal. Uh, but if they haven't wrapped something that you want to do, or it doesn't work exactly the way that you think it should work, then now you're kind of out of luck. All right. With a, a what you see is what you mean type of editor like LaTeX, you're specifying exactly what you want for the entire document. And it's consistent, so you could say set all sections like this, or set the title situation like this, or set all of the margins like this, all these types of things that you can set that will be consistent throughout the document. And it's programmable, so if there's some kind of custom functionality, I'm going to show you some cool pictures of different types of prints with LaTeX, but um, it's programmable, so you can embed algorithms in there and do basically make it look however you want. So all the big names there, if you're doing any kind of publishing, you've seen Elsevier, IEEE, ACM, Sage, Springer, all these, many, 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 many more. These are just some that I confirmed today, but um, all of them have some kind of LaTeX path and some of them prefer LaTeX. Publishing houses, big book publishing houses, there's a team of people that are working in it. So it is kind of a more professional option, but again, as we talked about, there is a um, barrier to entry. Some of the aphorisms that I like that kind of go along with this, even in the WYSIWYG editors, sometimes you have to get nitty gritty, right? Sometimes you're looking at white space and line breaks and revealing certain hidden codes. You know, one question is if you're doing that already, why not just show all the codes, right? Why, have, why haven't they exposed that so that you can pretty much give it any type of command? And then there's the old aphorism, if you want something done right, you got to kind of do it yourself anyway. So it's, you're not, you don't want to be at the mercy of those buttons that they've exposed to you. So LaTeX is very high quality typesetting. Um, the algorithms have been around for a long time. Some of the original algorithms by Donald Knuth and his graduate students are still used in lots of other systems. Um, things for typesetting, math and uh, table of contents, things like that. It's programmable, versatile, customizable. You'll see there's lots of packages. It's highly platform independent. So it's just like similar to like HTML code. It's just text with some formatted tags. So you can take that to any system 
And by and large, it's going to look the same. Okay. Once you start doing, you know, very advanced things, then it might depend on the engine you're compiling it with. But for the most part, it's going to look the same, which isn't always the case with a WYSIWYG editor, right? You open up a version of Word on one system, then you open it up on another system. It's using a slightly different version. It has to convert some stuff and things don't always look the same. Also, I should note LaTeX is free and it's open source. So you might think it's just for science papers. But you could check out these links um, or just go searching on some nice things that you can do with LaTeX. And I'm just going to show you different screenshots that I cut out today. So, of course, you can do math formatting. I'll talk about Donald Knuth in a bit, but I mean, he's obviously partial to mathematics. He's a very well, probably one of the top five computer scientists in terms of how um, influential they were in the, the 20th century for computer science. So obviously math formatting is, is a big part of the, the tech and LaTeX um, uh, algorithms. But also it's not just math, right? It's not just equations, you know, set theories. All, there's packages for all kinds of interesting math related things, vectors, um, aligning your equations. Doing this stuff in Microsoft Word, by the way, is super painful. I don't know if any of you have tried to do that before with the equation editor but it's extremely painful. I imagine these days, hopefully they've improved that. I, I probably haven't done it by hand in five years or so. Maybe they have some plugins to make this kind of stuff easier, uh, but getting it to look really nice with all your math notation, I remember being very slow and very painful. Of course, multilingual, any types of languages, you can have documents with different languages in there. And some of these packages are really creative in terms of not only the fonts, but uh, the symbols, the symbology that they use um, so that you can build really, you know, complex text here that has both explanations and symbols. Um, it's really kind of idea. It's, it's, it's like the, the next best thing to handwritten and even better because it's going to look a lot cleaner, but you can get exactly what you want. But there's so much more, right? Uh, people do their CVs in them. This is an example of a CV. Um, or, you know, book publishing, it's very nice, um, you know, layouts to the early pages of a book or professional documents. Like I said, multi-languages and using the right packages. This isn't even complicated or hard to do. Book publishing, as I said, speaking of books, like there's um, Edward Tufte, statistician, mathematician, professor, is known for producing very nice visualizations of statistical work visualization in general. He produces very nice, you know, slides and books. So there's actually a LaTeX document class called Tufty Book based on his work. So if you make a document starting with that type of document class, it gives you access to commands and, and areas and things to do these like margin figures and certain fonts that he uses and things like that. This is another very nicely formatted book that I found. Again, I found all this stuff within like an hour of searching, putting this together, because there's so many good examples out there. Um, you can do things like this. Again, remember, uh, we have algorithms, right? So you can see they've embedded a little for loop here. This is part of Tix is a package in LaTeX. Basically lets you do all your drawing of anything, you know, primitives, lines, polygons, points, um, like curves, it's all this kind of stuff. Here's some more interesting stuff. Right. You've seen these types of things, uh, you know, social media type of websites today where you can kind of enter a bunch of text and put it in a shape in a mask. That's also very easy to do with LaTeX as well. Reproductions. So, you know, people are often taking old printed copies of things that they want to digitize, but more than just take a picture, perhaps put it in a format that they're going to be able to scale and extend or make some modifications to it. Maybe they want to reprint it. Right. And so you can see this is a printed original and this is the LaTeX uh, reworking of it. You can see you can get very close there. But in terms of getting the font, getting the layout right, even to the word, right, giving the spacing, the layout to the exact word has um, all been lined appropriately. And now it can be used in all different systems. I saw this today, some of these older hand drawn. Uh, beautiful, you know, use, either used for art or mathematics or science in general, uh, when the publisher, the author was, you know, writing, but also maybe draw like a side drawings. And this kind of shading is called uh, stipples here that you would do with a pen. Well, here it is generated, you know, this is kind of trying to match this. 
um, generated with LaTeX and some algorithms to do that. Here's uh, emulating hand handwriting. So drawing this shape here, but based on different options that you're giving it, it's, it's doing it more squiggly to kind of make it look like hand drawnness uh, or different pen types, you know, the ballpoint pen or diamond paste, um, diamond head pen, things like that. Uh, I, this was a very cool one I saw today. I don't know how many are familiar with Randall Monroe and XKCD, you know, former NASA scientist gone cartoonist the last 20 years, put out, you know, different books on various topics that he feels interesting. But he's kind of got this iconic minimalist comic style. Well, I saw some threads and, and I've seen it on several sites. And I've seen it in Stack Overflow and then I've seen it in the tech stack exchange. Uh, basically, people trying to emulate his work algorithmically so that in their papers or in their documents or on their websites, they can have real data, but put into a graph format that looks very similar. So I think that's very cool. I'm sure he probably appreciates that as well. Here's a package called duck. <laughs> so you can have little duck creatures on your papers. And then I found there's a bunch of other creatures called ticklings because they're all drawn with that ticks package. These are all kind of rendered, you know, just from LaTeX code. Uh, you give it a single command and it draws one of these. And remember, this is all vector scalable artwork. So it's, it's more Illustrator than Photoshop, right? I don't know if, uh, if you guys kind of know the difference between Adobe Photoshop and Adobe Illustrator. They're basically the same program, very similar, except Photoshop is working with um, pixels, right? Rasterized images and Illustrator is working with vector artwork so that you can scale it to any size. It's better for print work in that case uh, as you're making it very large on posters and things like that. Uh, but roughly almost all the same functionality. So this is all vector graphic based as well because it's all algorithmically put together. There is a package for Sudoku puzzles, not only generating them, but solving them directly in your document, which is interesting. Uh, there is a package for chess artwork and symbols. So if you're writing up something about chess, it's fantastic to be able to kind of display it with the proper symbols if you're saying the moves one after the other. Um, there is, yes, because you wanted it, there is a package for coffee stains that gives you lots of different types of coffee stains that you can put on your document. So the point here is there's just all kinds of stuff you can do with LaTeX. This is a funny one that I saw today. How somebody, this is an older thread, but how do I make my document look like it was written by a Cthulhu worshiping madman? And there was various answers to that. Uh, someone looking up HP Lovecraft Society, certain fonts they recommend that are similar to script that he wrote. Others coming up with interesting ideas like this. This is a LaTeX document, right? This isn't done in Photoshop. So you can theme things very easily. All right, so to give a brief history before I do some LaTeX syntax, um, hopefully this doesn't last very long. To talk about LaTeX, you have to talk about tech. And to talk about tech, you have to talk about Knuth. All right, so uh, longtime Stanford professor, Donald Knuth, who is technically retired now. Like I said, he's won every or been awarded every type of uh, monumental math and computer science related uh, medal or award, National Medal of Science as well, foreign member of Royal Society. He's known for algorithms, algorithm analysis. He's known for tech, of course, which we're going to talk about. He's known for really kind of not really inventing, but doing a lot for digital typography. So he's written a book called Digital Typography as well, which is kind of a sum, summary of a lot of the work that they did um, in late 70s, 80s, even probably some of it in the early 90s. Uh, he was kind of famous for, uh, if you read any of his books or purchased any of his books anywhere, anybody in the world, not just at Stanford, he has uh, this little thing called this uh, reward checks, uh, Knuth reward checks. So he would give you $2.56 for any bug or misprint that you could find in his books. And then other professors at, at Stanford have done that as well. So I don't know if it was a collective, but he was certainly the most famous for doing that. He wrote a book or series of books called The Art of Computer Programming which he started in 1968. And he's had the, he had the ideas early as I think 63. Um, and he's still writing it today. Uh, he's, I think he's 83 today. It's not like he, he does this every day or maybe even every year, but every now and then he adds to this compendium of computer programming. And there's all kinds of algorithms and algorithm analysis and, and everything in there. 
um, over decades. And I don't know if he's reworked sections. He probably has. I don't know that much about the series. I personally have not read it, um, although I've seen bits from it over the years. Uh, but it's been called like the programming professions defining treaties, right? So there's, it's kind of more like a, a love for computer science. And uh, it's a very famous work. Uh, speaking of that, after I think it was his second, um, you know, volume that was coming out, there's this kind of famous quote here uh, in 1977. He said, look, the Gallic proofs have finally arrived and they look awful typographically. I've decided to solve the problem myself. So what was going on there is he was a fan of the old printing press style, you know, hot press style um, printing. And they had around that time switched to a photo printing setup. Because of that, they weren't able to really get all of the symbols the way exactly that the way that he wanted them, where he wanted them, the, the layout. And being someone that's, you know, pedantic OCD about computer science and math, he took on this problem. And so he started working on this program called uh, Tech. And it took him about 10 years, but you know, there were releases within a few years. I remember Tech, uh, I've read, I didn't remember. <laughs> I've read that Tech 83 was a pretty popular one. So within, you know, three to five years, he was already producing some of it. And he worked on it total about eight, nine, 10, 11 years uh, on this product. And the biggest thing that he did was separate your content from your style. Remember, there's no WYSIWYG editors at the time. So he developed that meta text or today we call a metadata type of system where you have text or data and then you're intersplicing it with commands. So it becomes like a meta text or metadata. HTML is very similar, right? You have what's going to be on your web page, but then tagged with these different tags. So it becomes like a metadata. But, you know, that was done later. Uh, many of his algorithms and his graduate students' algorithms are still used today. So the things that they develop for tech is still used in a lot of systems. I wouldn't be surprised if it's used in a lot of the major WYSIWYG editors as well. Um, things for math typesetting, hyphenation, line breaks, things like that. In terms of pronunciation, it is pronounced tech. It's um, tau, epsilon, chi, representation of that's not the real letters. An abbreviation for techni in Greek means art and craft. I don't know that much about Greek, but I've read that. I don't think this is the, the modern pronunciation or meaning necessarily. It's more of an ancient pronunciation and meaning, but that's where the, the name comes from. So people say tech or uh, as you'll see with LaTeX, it's LaTeX or LaTeX, but it's not text. So by the 90s, tech was getting a little dated. There was all these file formats and font systems coming out. The ASCII table is moving to Unicode, realizing the rest of the world is out there. We got to store everybody's languages. Um, we have these different formats. So tech was getting dated, but it was still beloved by those that had been using it this whole time. And even WYSIWYG editors in the 90s were very primitive. I would say even in the early 2000s, they weren't fantastic. So it was still a very good option, but it was pretty old by that point. All right, so the tech community started to develop and work on different, what they called adaptations or derivations, not taking the original tech source code and versioning it, but literally making different engines based on. It. So that went on for a while. There was very good contributions by certain people, but eventually even that got complicated and messy because now you had all these systems and some of the original tech uh, commands were not um, interoperable between the different systems. And so Leslie Lamport, who also, uh, by the way, I wanted to make sure I, I noted that he has a, a PhD as well, worked at some great companies known for distributed computing um, algorithms, the, the Byzantine general problem, it's kind of a famous computer science problem, things like that. So he was a very sharp cookie as well, almost the same age, maybe I think five years younger than Knuth. And he wrote LaTeX or LaTeX, which was basically not an engine itself, but kind of a wrapper of these other tech engines, all these adaptations that had all this different functionality. So when you write LaTeX code or formatting or commands, what you're doing is you're wrapping these other tech engines. You're passing it parameters based on the tech engine you want to use. You're giving it these parameters and they're being passed along. Okay. And that's kind of been the standard today. And lots of people have developed and worked on it since then. All right. So what finally, before we, I show some syntax, what is Overleaf? What is actually Overleaf giving us? So Overleaf is the brainchild of John Hammersley and John Lees Miller, uh, who developed Write LaTeX in 2012, a company to do shared LaTeX projects. Um, you can read all about them and you know why they developed the project, working with 
colleagues that are working in a WYSIWYG editor, they're working in LaTeX, they're trying to get together on a project, it's very cumbersome going back and forth and changing formats. Even if multiple authors were working in LaTeX, now you have to email the files back and forth or you got to have them on some shared server and there's different versionings when they're compiling that stuff locally, whatever engine you're using can cause hiccups. It's kind of a nightmare. So if you're doing collaborative work, they wanted something nice and easy and cloud-based that you know, people could just sign up and join like you do today with lots of shared um, services and write LaTeX together. You, know, you can log in at any time. It does everything for you. You just focus on LaTeX, it does everything else. So there's thousands of packages already installed on their servers. They're all updated with the latest versions. It's cloud-based, so you get all the normal things that you'd get from cloud software, like being able to access it, cloud storage, and you know, it's a thin client, so you can access it from a Windows machine, Mac, uh, Linux box, mobile devices, and you're still going to get the exact same information because it's pulling that from a server. They also offer a gallery of starter projects. Um, some of those projects are maintained by professional organizations. So like, for example, IEEE has templates up there. Elsevier has templates up there. Um, you can actually do publishing right from Overleaf now, which is interesting. I haven't done that yet, but as you'll see right from the gallery, you know, we can pull one of Elsevier's templates, start editing it, and then you can go to submit it right to an Elsevier journal right through Overleaf. Now, I'm sure at some point they do a handoff over to the publisher. So you actually have an account at the publisher side and you go through their formal process, but you can kind of initiate that process or find journals through Overleaf, which is interesting. They have very good technical support. I was just using their product and contacting them a lot. And they, within hours, sometimes they were helping me solve uh, things. And none of my questions were about Overleaf. It's so easy to use that it, it wasn't like, what about your interface? It was about how do you do this and like that. And if I couldn't find it on the internet for some reason, I was trying to do something specific, they would help me with it. So it was pretty cool. And they have all kinds of plans, free plans, student plans, sponsored plans, and paid plans. Okay, here are some resources. When you're learning, I'm going to do a simple document, and then I'm going to show you some other, you know, more complex documents. But just like when you learn any new system, say you're not a programmer and you want to learn how to make a web page with HTML, you don't go read an HTML book. It's too complicated. There's too much stuff in there. Okay. What you do is you go look at some other people's sites or you look at some tutorials or some templates, very simple sites. Um, and you start to pick apart or reverse engineer. Okay. What are they doing here? Let me make some edits and see how that changes. Right. Uh, that's one way. You can read a whole HTML book, but it's gonna, it's a huge time investment. I think it's usually better to kind of look at the end product, kind of work with it, and then go get the formal knowledge and complement that. I mean, however you want to approach it, you can. But they have a gallery of things. Um, they have a learn page, lots of documentation. CTAN is the Comprehensive Tech Archive Network. So this is a website that has all the packages, the formal place where all the LaTeX stuff is stored. And then the tech stack exchange is very much like Stack Overflow. It's part of that stack exchange uh, website where you can ask questions and get answers and they're voted on. And it's considered a very good set of websites for getting answers to technical problems. When you make an account on Overleaf, you're going to log into a system that kind of looks like this. So you'll have different projects that you can make. You can make different folders here. Um, like I can go ahead and just make a new project right now. I'm going to say new project. They have different types of projects you can start, or you can start going and pulling some from some templates. Like I said, let's start with something simple. So I'll make a blank project and then you'll see this type of screen or editor that pops up on the left. You have your LaTeX here. And on the right, you have your rendered, uh, document of what it's going to look like. You can set this to auto compile. So as you type, it can be compiling and rendering this for you. You can have it just show a draft version. So that's faster. There's all kinds of options here. I'm not going to do that. I like to kind of type. And then when I'm ready, I want to see the final project. So I hit control S and that's when I'll actually see the, the rendered product because that's going to trigger this recompilation. You can also press this. You can view errors. You can download your PDF immediately here. There's also a menu of all kinds of options, most of which I've never even touched. But again, you can change the type of compiler or engine it's using underneath, what the starting document is, all kinds of stuff that you could change here. But because LaTeX is more about the commands to drive what you want in your document, there isn't a lot here compared to something like a WYSIWYG editor. 
but you should know about this panel because it's also, again, where you can get your PDF and you can get the, uh, you can just download the source, all the files here um, as well. A reviewing thing, just like a WYSIWYG editor. So you could turn that on, track changes and approve them. You can, if I hit the share button, you can see everybody that's on it. I can share uh, there and you can give people different permissions. You could submit, like I was talking about, right through this interface. They have a, it's backed by Git. So you have a Git history of all the different changes and you can go to every single version of the document. There's a chat and so forth. All right. So it's supposed to be collaborative. Just like with HTML, you have like a, a body tag, right? So you have a begin and end document. And every command that you're ever going to see in LaTeX, let me, let me make this a little bit bigger just to make sure everybody can see this. It's going to begin with a, um, a backslash and the name of the command. And there's kind of a difference between commands and environments, okay? So command is like a simple thing. Right, it has the name of the command, and then you pass some information in here in some kind of parentheses, uh, either bracketed or parentheses or squiggly brackets. You'll see different variations, and then you have what's called an environment, which is basically an open tag and a closed tag. So that would be more similar to HTML. You'd have a body, you know, open and a closed tag, and everything that goes in there. Environments are really the the main way to do the formatting because you can put other commands inside of them. Once you start trying to put too many commands inside of a simple command, it can break because this is all based on, on macros. Okay, so this is the begin and the end of our document. What do we have that's going on here? We have some sections. So I'll just kind of duplicate this real quick. All right, uh, maybe data, methods. It does not have to be science-based. I'm just kind of sticking to that because it's the standard thing. And some of you may be using that as uh, when you go into graduate school. Uh, we'll put some text here in between our sections. This make title is a command that takes certain information about this document type. And then when you call this, is a very complex macro that is doing this formatting to give you the title like that. I should say these aren't available in all document types. So the top thing up here, this document class, you set a class type of the type of document that you want to make. Um, and there's a bunch of them. So, you know, just like you're doing other homework, you're used to... Um, you know, searching for this kind of stuff on the internet. So like LaTeX document class types. I want you to see, I don't know. Look, here you go. The overleaf documentation is so good that a lot of times when I'm searching anything about LaTeX, it's coming up. Sometimes it's coming up as the first link. That's how good their documentation is. So it's up there with all the official LaTeX um, document stuff. So creating a document in LaTeX, if I go here, you can see... They should have a table here. I'm pretty sure I've seen it before of the different class types. So there's an article type. These are like the default ones, report, book, beamers for doing slides, I guess more advanced version of slides for writing professional letters and so forth. I showed you earlier, there's a Tufty book, right? So you might have to download a separate class file, but you can basically do all different types of documents. And all that really does is it's not like you can't do the formatting you want in any particular one. It's just that it sets up the document a certain way. So it's easier to start writing a letter or it's easier to start writing a science article or it's easier to start writing a book because it's configured the document in that way. Okay, so this the article is kind of the default one. And what these are is how we import our different packages. Let me go ahead and render what we have so far. Maybe I wanna bold this. I could do this right up here, text, bold font, All right? And say, you know, this document is really cool. And we have formatting commands for doing underlining, italics, all that kind of stuff, right? Notice they have what's called an IntelliSense. As you start typing, it's, it's recommending different commands that you should use. You will pick these up over time. Of course, you don't know them right off. If you've never seen LaTeX before, you don't know them, right? So you will pick them up over time. Uh, let's put some more text in here. One of the packages that I like, I think is very cool, is called Lipsum. It gives you that lorem, it's some, um, you know, that, that standard uh, Latin phrasing for default text used in lights, lots of uh, topography. I also like to do something like this to start organizing my document. Not everybody does this. You know, I'm not saying this is the recommended way or anything like that, but I like to do this to kind of separate my sections. So um, this is the, you know, the preamble 
and this is where the actual document begins. And, um, you know, my packages are up there. Maybe I want some extra macros or definitions, uh, constants that I'm going to do, some variables or things like that. If you get to something complex, this kind of separates things out. Uh, but with this Lipsum package, I can, instead of just doing this silly stuff, I could say, give me some, give me one paragraph of that here. And then give me um, a couple of paragraphs here. Maybe my methods is the longest thing. Just give me the whole caboodle there. I'm hitting control S it's recompiling. You can see it's starting to fill up my paper with this fake Latin text here. I don't really like these margins. I think they're too big here. By the way, with document class, you can set like, you know, paper type. There's these options here. Um, you know, if you search that LaTeX article class options, like, there you go, paper size, draft modes, whether you want one column or two column formats. I am going to change the margins here. There's many ways to do it because LaTeX is just this system of macros and you have thousands of packages of macros to choose from. There's many different ways to do things and some better than others. Right? So it's worth going to search, especially on something like the tech stack exchange, and you'll find like interesting ways to do things. So here's, I'm just clicking on the, you know, one of the things on the first page, Hey, I want to do some kind of fill in ticks with uh, Venn diagrams. And you're saying, okay, there's some different options you can pass some different, uh, you know, packages that you can use. Um, and they're showing you not only the LaTeX code, but they're showing you what that will produce in the document. So there's this geometry package is probably the best, uh, most professional one. In fact, I just found out today looking at it on CTAN, CTAN geometry package. Uh, one of the, the primary editors of it is David Carlisle, who's very active on the tech uh, stack exchange. And he's done some amazing work. I'm sure he's probably written his own products as well. Every package that you ever look up on CTAN, it's going to have a page like this that has information about it. They'll have a document, it's usually a PDF. That's the standard output for LaTeX that explains how to use that package. You do not have to read all this at all. I'm just showing you that it's here. Here's like the definitive documentation on just using the geometry package, okay? With all kinds of options here. I'm not going to read that. I don't know everything that it does, but I do know that it has some options that you can pass when you load this package to set the different margins. So I could say like the top is one inch. You might, you might be able to just say margin is one inch and it does all of them. Okay, you can see it's changed things here. Um, maybe I want um, this information to be centered on the front page, but then um, you know everything moved down. There's different ways you can do that. I believe there's um, an environment for a title page. I don't know if we need a new page command there or not. Right, so you can do something like this. Okay, they have block comments as well. It also works with control forward slash. So you might have seen this before, and like your, if you do, if any of you have done any kind of programming or scripting, um, you might see that you can like block comment things very easily. So they support that. Lots of things that programmers have used before. All right, so we're kind of separating out our document a little bit more here. Well, I was going to show you to do how to do lots of little things, like you know, you could do. Uh, bullet points, uh, itemize is an environment for that. Enumerations, right? Same thing, but with enumerate instead of itemize, right? And each of these types of like standard things you can get right from their documentation. So I have it open. There's different ways. So there's usually a help up here, but if you don't see it there, it is here at the bottom. There's this documentation link. You can click on that and that'll take you to overleaf documentation, which I said is very good. They have right from that link, learn LaTeX in 30 minutes. So if you go here, they're showing you how to do very basic things. They talk about you know, a little bit of history, a little bit of what it is. Some of the things that I talked about here, the preamble versus the document, showing the make title command, comments, bolding, italicizing, right? You can download the document at the end. They're showing you how to insert uh, graphics and figures that have um, you know, captions and things like that. Um, but then, you know, all of these things, lists, you know, just working with lists or just working with mathematics. We want to throw in um, equations that you can embed equations right in the middle of a line like this, or you can use um, 
uh, a begin end environment syntax like this, and it will keep track of the actual um, equation numbers. So at the end, you can have a list of equations or you can cite the, the equations. All of these things are kind of explained. I'm kind of like just jumping to the documentation. I was going to do more, but I'm kind of realizing that I only have 12 minutes left because I spent too much on the history. I apologize about that. But I'm just trying to show you there's lots of documentation here that you can read. And this is not, you know, it's not like reading, you know, a very complicated textbook. Uh, these are simple tutorials that again, you could do in 20, 30 minutes, a couple of hours, and you can be pretty proficient with the syntax of LaTeX. And again, even those of us that use it a lot, so this is a good transition into my other documents, I have to look this stuff up all the time, right? So if I'm doing a certain type of formatted document, let's say here's a paper that I published that, that got published early this year in January, obviously this is gonna be a much bigger project if I hit share, you would see other authors that are shared on here. It's going to have a longer history. This is going to take a little bit to compile. Header, footer, this whole format is the format that the journal that I was um, submitting to was accepting the papers in. So it had to be using their templates. So some of this stuff I didn't write. I just downloaded that class template. And then I started filling out you know, my sections, things that I cared about, the packages that I wanted to include. Uh, very often what I do in my documents is instead of writing my main tech here, I include them from other files. So you do that with this input command. And then I have separate tech files here that actually have some very basic tech. I'm just including it on the main file. And you can see I've organized them like this so that I have each one of my sections separately. All right. So this is a rather complicated document, but I could show you that I use it for other things. So I've written a document just to show how to use a package for some friends of mine. So I like this overpick package. It allows you to load an image, but then draw over it, which I think is very useful for figures. You know, when you want to show several images inside of a figure and you're contrasting between A, B, C, or whatever, or you want to show like a picture in picture, or you want to highlight certain things of the image, draw something on it. So so here is some LaTeX to generate a document talking about a LaTeX package. Um, so this is called overpick is the package. And you know the code is here inside this document to be able to do little things like this. You know How do I overlay text onto an image? So with the overpick package, so you have to have include that package, you start this environment and end this environment uh, for overpick and you can load your image, specify the size that you want the image, and then anything in between this environment, they have commands here, these put commands for putting anything, putting text at a certain grid location. It, it basically grids this up like in Cartesian space, but then you can use that to start drawing text or drawing images over your images, right? Highlighting things, drawing polygons, circles, things like that, overlaying an image onto an image, which I think is cool because then you can kind of break out of the structure of the document over you know, you can overlay onto um, your section headers and things like that. But this is what I'm talking about for, let's say a scientific paper. A lot of times when people generate their images for their paper and they have these different renders, putting this, this kind of subscripts in there, like this is result A, B, C, D, and then they reference that in the caption. Uh, a lot of times we bake that into images, but that's not a good solution because it doesn't scale like the rest of the text does. It may not have the same font. So it's very nice to use a package like this where you can write directly over it and then you can use, you know, basically cite or use these A, B, C, and D in your caption to talk about these different images. And this is rendered with the real text. Any of these things, by the way, you could contact me and I can share them if you want to see different examples. I have an, a, an assignment template. So some of my graduate school assignments that I submitted used this template. And this template was actually one that I downloaded from LaTeX templates and then I modified it to be the way that I like. But basically it has a title page with a table of contents, which is all clickable and works. You know, it has your name, class you're in, contact information, assignment, when it's due, section, table of contents. And then I have these different problems and answer sections. Uh, and I have commands for that. So, you know, begin a problem, start writing the text of your problem, and then begin an answer section and start writing that information. Right? So I have different problems and things. So whenever I was doing like very formal math or uh, something where I wanted some structure to look like kind of like a textbook, 
type of solution, I would turn my assignment in like this. And it's very clean and nice. I'm looking for something. Uh, my assignments for my students. So, you know, I'm a professor as well. So the assignments that I give my students, I have uh, LaTeX uh, implementations of all of these, right? So they have when it's due, a table of contents here, very similar to what you saw before, but then I have different sections for like the rubric, maybe sometimes a contract, things like that. And then I just, you know, I copy, I make a copy of the project and then I go and start filling it out. So let me show you copying projects, actually. Let's go to, um, let's go to the gallery. So overleaf slash gallery, or I think I could do this, like view all, there we go. So these are templates or gallery, I think takes you the same page. Let's say we wanted a formal, a formal letter, right? There's all kinds of stuff on here. I, again, this is, it's free, it's shared. Some of it's by professional, some of it's just like people like you and me, right? Look at all these templates on here. You just click on one. Okay, this one looks interesting. Open as template. Now they've just on the back end put those files into a project in your account, right? So I go back up to, you know, all my projects, I uncategorized uh, section here. I have this copy, uh, which I can further copy, move around, delete, archive, whatever. Can change the name of it up here of the project. I can look at, you know, what document type they're using. So here's an example of letter type. And these are some of the options that are being passed in there. This, these are the different uh, packages that this person is including. And here's the render of it right here, right? And I can, I can just take something like this and just start changing this. Right. I could fill out a different name right in here. All right. Different address. And I could use this basically as is. Okay. Which I think is very, very cool. It makes this very simple. I understand the commands are not, you know, it's not as simple as opening up word or Google docs and immediately start typing. But as you know, even if you're going to do something professional in a WYSIWYG editor, it's going to take time to learn the styles, learn where all the options are and um, basically go through all of this, uh, this work to get it to look the way that you want it to work. So, you know, there's a, there's a little bit more of um, uh, a, a hurdle to learn the LaTeX syntax, but they've made everything else so streamlined. And you get used to this. You get used to writing use package to bring in packages. You get used to writing begin and end uh, environments and commenting things out and specifying when you want very specific uh, line breaks. There's all kinds of other commands I wanted to show you that we just don't have time for, but setting spaces the way that you want, you know, header format, images, figures, bibliography. The bibliography is a snap. There's another technology called BibTeX, so another kind of, you know, variation of tech uh, called BibTeX, and it's for bibliography specifically. In your main tech file, all you got to do is say, if it's using BibTeX, you call this bibliography command and give it the name of a bib file. And this bib file, all it is, is a list of your references, you know, the different types like conference proceedings, you know, formal journal articles, books, things like that, a web, something on the web page, a custom thing. And you're just filling out the information, not the formatting, the information of what that reference is, right? And then by including it like this, it's going to throw that bibliography at the end. Now, the way that it formats it is totally up to you. There are commands and configurations you can do. Maybe the journal you're submitting to or however you, your teacher wants it, you want to number these or you want to alphabetize them or organize them in a certain way. There's also like what the, these are called like class files and other types of files here. Like this is a formatting, a, a bibliography style file that was provided with this template that specifies all that. I didn't write this, right? And I'm not... I know this looks daunting, but you don't have to write this. You can download one of these and every major conference or journal that you're going to submit to is going to have some kind of template and the way that they want these to appear and the way that you cite them. Citing name of author and the, um, uh, the year um, that the author published. This is what the citation look like. looks like. It is down here in the bibliography, right? All of that is defined by this custom file. Um, Sorry, I know that was, it was kind of very quick. I, I probably should have spent so much time on the uh, presentation and the, um, the history of it, but I just wanted to give you an intro so that you kind of know what it is that you're dealing with, what LaTeX is, how easy it is to interface with Overleaf. And um, like I said, if you just go to the gallery and get some very simple looking letters or articles or documents and start with that, you can start manipulating 
um, that tech source and make some changes and you're already going to have a professional looking document up, I promise, in a very short time. And you'll only get better at this. All right. And as you saw from the presentation, you can do things beyond that. Very cool stuff. I wouldn't call myself a LaTeX expert, but I have used it on and off for many years. Um, so I can answer questions on some of the syntax or how to do things or, you know, mainly tell you where to search because I end up doing a lot of searching and a lot of those come up on tech stack exchange. I, I think it depends on um, your field of study. So certainly the quantitative sciences do, but if you're, you know, if, if you're something more qualitative or you're publishing to a journal, like I know Nature, which is a very well-known journal, does not prefer LaTeX. They prefer Word, but they do accept LaTeX. So it really depends on the publication. But I, you know, I don't have any stats. I should have looked that up. But my guess is that most scientific publications would prefer LaTeX over Word. But that could just be an assumption or a guess. Um, you can do more complicated stuff with LaTeX. You can get it to look you know, very specific in a very specific way. And it's, uh, you can manipulate it. And again, versioning doesn't really matter and all this kind of stuff. So, um, there's also been a pipeline for decades for some of these publishers that are using that under the hood. So I would say it's for graduate school. Yes. It's a good skill to know. And if you're in a quantitative science, you should definitely be semi familiar with it. Even if at the end of the day, you end up doing word, it's just going to give you more options, more power. You'll be able to collaborate with more people. Anybody else? Don't be shy. All right. Well, again, you can email me. I'm Joe Del Rocco. You should have my email from the invite and I can answer any questions about it. Uh, I think it's just an, a very good option. If you ever want to do any LaTeX, don't bother with installing anything locally anymore. Just get on Overleaf. Um, it's free to use all the basic good um, uh, options. And th these projects are so small. I mean, yes, you can have lots of images, but still they're relatively small. So storage hasn't been a problem. I've never, they've never sent me an email saying you're storing too much. And I have tons and tons of these projects. So I think it's just a very good option for using LaTeX uh, if you want to get started with that.